really a pleasure um, to be able to engage and share and maybe even debate ideas uh, with so many great minds in this virtual space uh, around this wonderful book and uh, around this interdisciplinary conversation on, uh, on culture, mind, and brain. So um, I'm going to present uh, around, pardon me, let me make sure my slides are working. OK. OK, let me backtrack a little. Um, so I'm going to talk about the book chapter, Internet Sociality, uh, that I worked on with uh, Mariah Stendhal and Maxwell Ramstead. Uh, but let me frame this conversation by uh, letting you in on what I intend to do today. So the world has changed dizzyingly, some might say worryingly fast uh, since we worked on that chapter. And of course, my, my thinking on, on these issues has also changed, has also evolved. Uh, so rather than painstakingly and painfully walk you through all the points of the chapter, I want to just present a, a general outline, a general spiel of, of, of the approach, um, uh, the theoretical approach of the chapter, and then present a set of uh, emerging new questions and new trajectories, but also uh, workshop some uh, ideas that I've been working on for, for quite some time, some ideas which I should confess still don't fully make sense uh, to me. So. Uh, I started working on, on the internet about a decade ago, uh, as I was in the process of transitioning from the first career in cultural and political anthropology to cognitive and evolutionary anthropology. In many ways, it is by studying the internet that, uh, that I became a cognitive anthropologist. So in 2011, seems like, like 100 years ago now, uh, I was commissioned to write a book chapter on uh, kinship, kinship uh, human intimate relations, uh, human families and human relations as they were increasingly being mediated online. I then went on uh, to become very interested in how new forms of human subjectivities, new forms of human affects, new identities, new human experiences arose in and around the internet. And I started studying a community of people who call themselves topomancers, who create uh, mostly a community of anon people who meet anonymously online to discuss uh, how they create imaginary friends which they claim have become sentient. And in studying the internet, I, I got to revisit an old, in many ways, foundational question in the social sciences, which is how do, well, what is society and how do imagined communities come into being? How do people who mostly uh, never meet one another, never interact with one another in the, in the flesh, acquire uh, rather similar ways of feeling and, and being and so forth. So, so this, got, this got me to study uh, the, the cognitive substrates of, of sociality a lot more. And this increasingly led me to the idea that uh, in many ways, imagine communities, societies, but also the human mind already work like the internet. So this was uh, one of the central approaches of our book chapter and in, 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 in I'll, talk, I'll talk a bit about that and I'll get in fact in a lot more depth uh, than we cover in the chapter. So first um, I'll go, I'll extend the temporality back in time and uh, present a very brief outline of uh, human cognitive and sociocultural evolution uh, through the lens of information theory and through the lens of the human relationship with tools and tools of information uh, technology, information storage and diffusion in, in particular. Then I'll be back in the present and in the future and uh, I'll get to ask again uh, in a variety of domains and through a variety of examples, uh, well, what happens to human sociality now that it is primarily mediated online and this question was already pertinent before uh, the COVID crisis, before uh, human sociality became literally uh, only um, mediated online. So then I'll present something of a provocative thesis, and this is really the one that I, that I need help uh, thinking about. Uh, so one that I really welcome being challenged uh, about, which is the proposal that the internet has brought about the total McDonaldization of human thought of human affect, uh, of human social relations, 
And McDonaldization, I'll, I'll get there. Uh, it, it's, uh, it's in fact a very serious paradigm in Weberian sociology to describe the trade-offs that happen as a result of increased uh, standardization and a search for predictability and transferability in different domains of, of human life. And then I'll get into a little bit of a, of a micro sociology uh, of uh, what I'm tempted to call cognitive, affective, and political obesity. And I'm going to go on to make a claim uh, that we as a species are facing such a crisis. So uh, another final um, introductory side note, most of my current empirical work is painstakingly clinical. Uh, so I work on uh, trying to understand mechanisms of smartphone and screen addiction and also uh, testing different intervention strategies for digital harm reduction. Uh, I'll only mention some of this work in passing, but I should specify now, as I'm sure many of you know, that even before the COVID crisis, there was something of a moral panic uh, about the impact of the internet on human life, uh, in particular on the impact of the internet on, uh, on young people. So, to simplify the picture, there's a growing camp of scholars like the psychologist Jean Twenge or Jonathan Haidt uh, who claim that the internet is associated with uh, increased psychopathology, increased suicidality among young people, uh, but also increased social and political polarization, that it's an absolute disaster. Then there are other scholars, there's a group of researchers at Oxford who say, no, there's actually not really much of a correlation. Things are a bit more complex. Now. You should all know where I situate myself in, in, in these questions. I typically, despite my sometimes provocative rhetoric, I typically like not to pick sides uh, in polarized moral panics. I like to remain in the uncomfortable middle, uh, in the nuances and the ambiguities. But when it comes to this particular question, to this particular debate, I am afraid that for once I side with the pessimists. Um, because I also very often as an anthropologist who enjoys explicitating uh, current social problems, I often like to point out that no, things are not as bad as they seem, you know, in so many domains. When it comes to the internet, I think things are very bad. Uh, and um, well, I'm, I'm gonna need your help to, to think about these questions. So again, I don't need to tell you, we're now facing uh, a moment in history uh, where increasing, increasingly large and fragmented groups of people appear to believe in completely alternate realities, alternate uh, cosmologies that are becoming increasingly competitive, martial, warlike uh, in many ways. So it, it may very well be that this was always the case that the internet simply sheds light uh, on a problem that already existed, or perhaps that it exacerbates it uh, in some interesting and worrying ways. Then I'll finish if I have time with uh, another sort of case study that really goes back to my, my, uh, my first studies of the internet, which is um, the question of romantic life, courtship uh, and sex, uh, now that it is primarily mediated through dating apps. I'm, I'm very interested in this question. Again, thinking generally as an anthropologist about internet sociality, uh, I have to remind myself that uh, there can be no sociality if people don't meet, if they don't reproduce, and if they don't find culturally viable ways of, uh, of raising functional offspring. So uh, the game has changed really quickly um, when it comes to that, and I think this, this warrants a careful anthropological investigation. Okay. Um, so because I have the nasty habit of, of never managing to get to even a full third of my slides when I give a talk, allow me to make my, my thesis, which is either a thesis or a provocation, or really simply a question explicit, because this is, this is what I need help thinking about. Um, and this is again another, another question in social science, which is have things become more complex or uh, more simple? So what I'm gonna go on to argue is that a lot of the current day malaise and anxiety and fear, uh, but also the rise in polarization and psychopathology can largely be explained by a double bind, by uh, two contradictory in injunctions, two contradictory in many ways opposed uh, processes of transformation that are not apparent, 
and that make people crazy. So on the one hand, I'm going to go on to argue that human forms of life have become uh, more, more fragmented than ever, more individualistic, uh, more diverse, more entropic. So individualism is very interesting because it is, of course, a collectively ascribed uh, normative social system that confers an immense array of choice and responsibility on the individual who has to, uh, for finding a um, life path, for finding meaning, um, for finding uh, explanatory models. And this is extraordinarily anxiogenic. And this reflects a process of increased complexity, of increased entropy. On the other hand, uh, and these two processes that, are described, that I'm describing, I'm going to go on to argue, uh, uh, were spearheaded in um, high in economically high income, culturally post-traditional countries, but they're spreading very rapidly to the rest of the world, uh, of course, thanks to or, or because the internet. So I'm also going to go on to argue that in spite of this increase in complexity in some domains, uh, human lives have also never been so standardized, bureaucratic, constrained and reduced to very few platforms and vectors and themes of information, of thought and of interactions. And I'm gonna of course keep arguing that the internet is, is, is uh, if not primarily the main causal mechanism, it is deeply, deeply implicated uh, in this uh, anxiogenic or maybe even schizophrenogenic double bind. My second thesis, which is uh, a sort of a theoretical substrate of this, uh, this entire approach here, uh, uh, is an old debate uh, in social science between Marxists and neo-Marxists in uh, behavioral science uh, between information theoreticians and behavioral ecologists. The thesis here contra uh, the uh, optimal forager models of behavioral ecology is that our understanding of human needs of say Maslow's hierarchy of needs, what drives uh, human societies, hum uh, social evolution and what drives human conflict is not material. It is not um, natural resources. It is not just a search for meeting caloric and reproductive needs, but it is symbolic that people primarily fight for meaning. So the basic idea that I'm gonna go on to retell through the lens of uh, the evolution of uh, human niches is that by far the most important resource for humans to survive is social support. It is care, love, validation, uh, the gaze of others, if you will. And this is the resource that we compete for that is a proxy for having our basic reproductive and caloric needs met. What is more, symbolic and moral status and being able to identify socially pertinent moral status conferring information is again the most important resource. This is the one attentional bias that drives most of what humans do. It is again a proxy for survival, but whatever. This such is the dilemma I claim of being a symbolic species. So I'm going to argue that people mostly fight over meaning, over explanatory and moral models, rather than just oil and gold and uh, natural resources, and that the internet has brought about an unprecedented exponential hystericization of this trend, and that we may be, unless we pull the plug, beyond what I'm tempted to call the verge of no repair. So now, a few key definitions in what is sociality. So sociali sociality, and here I'm using more of a biological sciences definition. It refers to uh, a species ability um, to engage in joint goals, joint action, develop shared ways of doing things. Phenomenologically for humans, the ability, shared ways of feeling, so shared techniques of the body, ways of sleeping, you know, dreaming and so on. Uh, and so forth. Sociality is of course not unique to Homo sapiens, but it is something that we do a lot more than other species and something that has in many ways come to characterize just all aspects of our very existence. Um, don't have time to get into those cognitive affective substrates too much. So uh, again, with uh, Maxwell Ramstead, Lawrence Kermeyer, Axel Constant now 
uh, called Friston. We have, we have done a lot of work uh, trying to uh, elucidate uh, the, the evolution of the cognitive substrates of sociality through the lens of the free energy principle that I'll only talk about a little. Uh, but the minimal requirement for being a social species is sometimes called mind reading or perspective taking or joint intentionality, namely uh, the ability to understand that other people have thoughts, uh, silent propositional attitudes, to entertain counterfactual ideas about how people might have internal states that are different from the ones that are stated, but also simply the ability to know that other people know that they know that I know and so all these recursively nested levels of joint intentionality that enable us uh, to develop shared ways of doing things. So from this, we get culture, uh, which by which I mean something like a cumulative repertoire, uh, but cumulative meaning with that which iterates, which grows fr from generation to generation, a repertoire of tools and symbols and, and ciphers and uh, knowledge, skills, goals, and ritual prescriptions to which we humans outsource all of our fitness relevant so solutions. And culture is cooperative in the very literal sense that in order to function optimally in the world, but even to learn how to walk and sleep and, and feed ourselves and find mates or whatever it is that species do to survive, we need to tap into this cultural repertoire that no single one of us could ever have invented on our own. Um, So let me talk a little bit about how the human mind already works like the internet, then go on to talk about the, the evolution of uh, different information and technological niche for the human species. So I don't have time or unfortunately, or I'm not very skillful on the, the digital format of being didactic at asking people, what do you think? What do these images have in common? Were I in a classroom, I, I would do this. Um, so I'm not sure if any of you can see an obvious connecting threads between these different images, but um, I will tell you, um, these have all at some point in time been used as a metaphor for the human mind or for human consciousness. So uh, in, 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 for Plato, there was, the, the, there was a chariot with the, you know, reason and emotions and desire and then reason being the human driver of emotions. You know, Leibniz mentioned a, a windmill, uh, Descartes, a hydraulic pump. Uh, Freud talked about the steam engine. By the time John Searle, the philosopher uh, of mind was getting to these questions, the telephone switchboard was a favored metaphor for the human mind. And now, of course, uh, we routinely compare the human mind uh, to a, a computer. I myself think that these metaphors have been getting increasingly uh, poor. I, I much prefer Plato's metaphor. At least there's there's a bit of affect. Yeah, there's there's some sort of animal drives. There's in fact uh, non-human entities. It's a, it's it's a much more embodied, affective, and sort of extended uh, metaphor than the the autistic algorithmic computer. But uh, so there's a few things that are interesting here. This helps me make my point about you know how how we need culture. It seems that at any given point in time and space, uh, intelligent people will pick whatever is most sort of technologically advanced at the time, what is culturally imaginable as most technologically advanced at a time as a tool to say, this is how the human mind works. I for one claim that, uh, and, and hopefully I'm not succumbing to this sort of uh, teleological fallacy of, of yet again picking the latest technology, but I for one think that, that the internet is by far the best metaphor to describe the human mind uh, because indeed, human minds already only, can only ever function um, basically or optimally when they're connected to a network of other minds to which they almost literally download information and cultural packages to suit all their, uh, all their fitness and survival needs. Now, what I find interesting is that human sociocognitive and cultural evolution, I claim, it's been a process of making increasingly explicit, increasingly exponential, strong, rational, standardized, and literal, most of our inner pro proclivities through tools. And the internet is basically the super tool 
uh, that extends and exponentiates most of our proclivities, most of our drives, I'm gonna go on to argue most of our worst drives, our dark passions. Um, so it's the most aggressive superhuman human tool ever, de ever devised. I'm gonna go on to give some definitions. Uh, so what you might ask uh, is a tool, now tool used is definitely one dimension of experience in which uh, humans excel uh, compared to other species. Um, uh, it, it is probably the most species unique capacity that we have. Uh, other species uh, don't, really, don't really use tools or don't iterate or improve upon tools from generation to generation. That's, that's a side story. But a tool, it's, it's any kind of apparatus that uh, externalizes and that makes exponential an internal human capacity or a skill. So often philosophers are fond of uh, the example of the hammer, uh, which, which externalizes and makes much stronger, much more precise the strength of the human arm. I don't think it's possible for humans to invent a tool that is not based in some kind of a, a, a natural, innate, evolved, embodied capacity. So even something as outlandish as, uh, as the space shuttle uh, is just an externalization and an exponentialization of the human body's capacity for motion. What's interesting about tools, of course, from an evolutionary perspective is that we have created tools that have precip precipitated us through a sort of a ratchet effect. The ratchet turns only one way, it sort of can't go back, which through tool use, we have modified our very physiology. So the, the famous story told by the biologist Richard Rangham is that the domestication of fire um, gave us shorter intestines and bigger brains. We were able to save uh, a lot of energy on digestion uh, and, 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 you know, offload it to the frontal cortex uh, and work on different things. Uh, and by many accounts, the invention of language, which is a tool, and I'm going to talk about that, has also radically changed our brains, you know, our bodies, our sociality, and so forth. But with each uh, niche transition into becoming dependent on more tools, there are, of course, trade-offs. So there are benefits that are obvious. So increase in strength, skill, power, et cetera, energy conservation. So this is what uh, all life forms uh, and the human brain um, chiefly among all is really good at finding the path of least energy expenditure, finding the most efficient way uh, to do things. And the risks are uh, the, the dark side of the trade-offs is that, well, when we become too dependent on particular tools, uh, then uh, this brings about a particular, like, something of an atrophy of uh, the human capacities that are we, we're no longer using, that we have externalized. And with hyper-specialization comes uh, a loss of generalized skin set, uh, skill set. So in terms of entropy, which I'll discuss later, which uh, in, in simple information theoretic terms, the amount of possible states that an organism might visit in a, in a given ecology, um, Often the more specialized and powerful the tools become, the more the loss of entropy, the more there are many things that we're not doing, many things that we're not, not feeling anymore. By far, the most potent and violent and, and, and all encompassingly transforming tools that humans have excelled at devising are tools of information technology. Um, and with those uh, very profound cognitive and social trade-offs have happened. So now I want to go through a very, very brief uh, history and outline of uh, the human or species transition into different information technological niches. So the first tool is of course spoken language. Uh, we don't often think of language as a tool, but on this question, contra Steve Pinker, I very much side with Michael Tomasello, who in his response to Steve Pinker's idea of a language gene said, you know, all human groups are capable of cooking. Uh, this is something that is culturally transmitted. We've yet to identify a cooking gene. So 
the evolution of language is still very debated. It is likely that the first forms of communication were gestural, uh, and then spoken language arose at a time when humans became um, so behaviorally modern. We don't really know when, uh, but uh, by 100,000 years ago, we know for sure that there's lots of evidence of complex symbolic, symbolic activities and status marking, tattooing, elaborate rituals, uh, and, and so on and so forth. I often like to think as language as something kind of like iPhones or the internet or print media that would like something of a craze that might have swept through uh, young populations. And I like to imagine old paleolithic elders just grunting in silence and thinking about how the youth are now becoming corrupt now that they're using this language technology. By language technology, I mean the capacity to already start externalizing knowledge by encoding units of sound with meaning, by collectively together agreeing to maintain, pass on and elaborate this sort of meaning alive. And of course, with the evolution of language, we start seeing um, a little bit of a McDonaldization process. So by 30,000 years ago, a full 15,000 years before the Neolithic, we see uh, an explosion of new forms of representation, say lion-headed or Venus statues and new hunting, new hunting technologies and so forth that sort of spread uh, virally because the, the vectors of information diffusion and storage became just much more efficient, much, much more uh, powerful. The next big game changer is writing, of course, um, which now makes literal the capacity for what the cognitive archaeologist Merlin Donald called external symbolic storage. So rather than effortfully storing meaning into sound and making sure that we all remember uh, the cipher and we all remember how to keep that sound alive, we can now store it into literal tablets and all we have to pass on from generation to generation is the cipher. And then the body of knowledge that can be stored and, and spread, uh, of course, um, increases. Those of you who have read uh, Plato or Derrida for that matter, uh, will know that uh, there were a lot of, uh, at the time, uh, conservative distrust of this new language technology, this new writing technology. So in Phaedrus's dialogue, uh, the Pharaoh who is being presented with this invention, hey, look, we can store our memories in these signs. And the Pharaoh says, why would I want to do that? Why would I want to just, you know, commit these uh, dead signs, you know, outside of my head and sort of lose my memory, lose my, lose my capacity to think. So uh, ever since the invention of writing, but probably before, there have been strong so-called quietist philosophical movements, people who are very distrustful of language and in particular writing's capacity to connect us uh, to the world. It is of course interesting from the cognitive perspective that literate societies tend to lose their memory. They tend to quite literally lose their head. Uh, and Michel Serre has a wonderful little book about that uh, called La Petite Poussette, uh, Thumbelina. Um, uh, in, uh, in oral societies, remember all the skills, values, knowledge, the entire cultural packages in their infinite you know, richness and granularity have to be kept alive in people's heads and bodies uh, and, and stories. So as such, they have better episodic and semantic memories. They probably, uh, my, I think my colleague Véronique Bobot would agree, they probably have a much thicker, much bigger hippocampus. They might be as such, you know, less prone to depression, anxiety, dementia, sort of who knows. So writing is already a, a process of sort of, you know, slowly kind of uh, externalizing too much. So we're not yet in the moment where we can't go through a city we grew up in without a GPS or we can't remember our mother's phone number, but the, 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 the process has started. Interestingly, we can't yet speak of causation, but let's note an association and a, a correlation between the invention of writing and on the one hand, uh, a, a huge Baroque expansion of the intricacy and complexity of religious and cosmological narratives, but also uh, an exponential increase in a militaristic, imperialistic endeavors that are also on the same side of the 
uh, different side of the same coin, well, an increase in exploration and novelty seeking and networks of trade in, in hybrid forms of life and in, in hybrid narratives. So, you know, things are never just good or bad. That's just the human mind wants to uh, repackage things that way. But, uh, but for sure, there, there seems to be a strong association between the invention of writing and mass violence and mass intra-group and intergroup conflict. So if the thesis that uh, humans primarily compete uh, over meaning, over normative models for you know, what the world is and, and how it ought to be and so forth, it seems that writing made, made that uh, a, a little more, um, more explicit and more violent. The next one has been well studied in the social sciences. Uh, you know, uh, Benedict Anderson uh, had a lot to say about that, but print media was for sure uh, a social, political, and cognitive game changer. So, so uh, as a side note, some of you may, may not know that uh, in medieval universities, people still had extraordinary memories. So when we talk about Albertus Magnus going to Rome and to rediscover uh, Aristotle uh, through the works of the Arabs and so forth, uh, it's not like he could photocopy, uh, you know, the, or, or manually copy uh, Aristotle, he just learned it by heart and he went back to the University of Paris and then, and then he taught it to his students. In any case, print media, uh, I think many of you have heard these stories. So for, for Benedict Anderson, uh, print media enables the fast and efficient spread of novel ideas, in particular, uh, the expansion of imagined communities of people who have never met one another in the flesh, but who feel intimately convinced that they have something so intrinsic is in common, so as to want to go and slaughter their neighbor. But the, the, the exponentiality of the timescale becomes really interesting after the commercialization of print media after Johannes Gutenberg uh, ripped off probably a, a Korean or, uh, or, or Chinese idea. It took less than a hundred years for people to go absolutely nuts and bonkers just because they were, uh, they were able to read more and teach themselves how to read. So the Protestant Reformation happens uh, after Martin Luther commits the blasphemy of translating the Bible into vernacular German. Uh, and then all kinds of crazy new neo sabbatarian sects and Anabaptists and Subotniks and what have you happen. But just having access to so much more knowledge and the possibility of so many more normative models that people can compete for leads very quickly to uh, massive butchery and religious warfare. Then, uh, of course, as we know, the, the scientific revolutions, the, the political revolutions, the enlightenment and so forth. And then this is both uh, Benedict Anderson and the sociologist Zygmunt Bauman's thesis. The logical conclusion of all this to make a long story short is the ethnic butchery of the 20th century, uh, the world wars and the Shoah. So uh, the Shoah, uh, the Jewish Holocaust um, is if not exceptional, uh, quite different from other genocides in that it was also a pinnacle of McDonaldized, rationalized, industrialized, uh, efficient, bureaucratic horror. So here we see uh, the transitions. Now, these next transitions that happen very quickly have, uh, I claim, yet to be properly uh, theorized. So we have very quickly in the 19th century, what you could call mobile invisible mass media. So the telegraph, the radio waves, and then increasingly the telephone, the, rat, the radio, uh, TV, and then later cable TV, and then uh, the fax and so forth. And then really quickly, the, the digital revolution happens. Uh, so by the late 90s, most people start, most people at least in uh, high income segments of high income countries start having the internet. And then very, very quickly in the blink of an eye again, uh, following the commercialization of the iPhone in 2007, uh, the mobile digital revolution happened. Interesting historical side note, uh, Steve Jobs used to say, he liked to say, you know, I never really intended for the iPhone to become the thing that it became. The iPod was quite popular at the time. So the idea was to create a portable iPod that's also a phone. And then kind of like these Blackberry government nerds, you could also maybe check your email. Well, little did we know. <laughs> little did we know we precipitated ourselves into something that none of us uh, could have planned. 
One transition uh, that I really feel has been completely under theorized and under appreciated is something that emerged with the cell phone. So again, most people, high income people in high income countries and then everybody else got their first cell phones in the late nineties or early two thousands uh, in and around the same time that they got the internet. But the cell phone brings about a very interesting temporal and social rupture. And here I am I'm indebted to the works of the cultural historian, Judith Shulevitz, uh, who wrote a wonderful book uh, on uh, the history of the Sabbath. So it sounds like sort of a, a niche religious history topic uh, about the holy day of rest and cultures that kept it and those that rediscovered it. But there's a lot more in that book. There's also a very interesting social history of time and something that she claims happens with the cell phone. So this is uh, my own paraphrase of an example she might have given, but, but consider the really historically novel performative possibility of saying, hey, I'm still stuck in traffic. I'm gonna have to cancel. So there is something like the beginning of the absolute cancelability of collective schedules that becomes possible once people have mobile phones. And for Shulevitz, this is one of the final blows to collective schedules. Now schedule sounds boring and, and you know, Shulevitz is really interested in the social history of schedules. But think about it from a second, for a second, from the perspective of most human societies had a sort of a cyclical, collectively organized ways of uh, looking at temporal markers of sort of rehearsing their history. So Shulevis is Jewish, so she focuses a lot on, on the sort of the cycle of Jewish holidays, beginning with the Jewish New Year, Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, uh, and then different opportunities to sort of, again, sit and eat together. So the Jewish New Year coincides with the, the harvest. In fact, most early festivals and, and holidays had something to do with the cyclical agrarian schedule. And then there has been with, uh, with modernization and modernity and, and increased atomization, there has been a gradual disintegration of a collective sense of time, a collective sense of history, a collective sense of meaning, a collective sense of uh, collective possibilities also of just social co coordination. So yeah, we might, you know, think well, schedules are boring and so forth, but, but how do you have a society without a collective sense of time, right? So with mobile time, we see, and this is, this is my own reading of, of Shulevitz and this, these historical transformations, but we have something of a peak rupture into already a much more anxiogenic, what I call semiotic individualism which is a regime in which people become increasingly responsible for finding and making meaning, purpose, and finding a path in all aspects of their lives. Um, and this also translates into actual you know, measurable interactions where, where people just don't meet up uh, anymore. Everything is cancelable. So now we get to my now we get to my double bind uh, that I want to spend the rest of, of my talk before the discussion, which I hope will happen. Um, which is, if you followed me so far, you will have seen how I have described more and less entropy in different domains of humans' forms of life. So on the one hand, in terms of systems of meaning, systems of ritual, systems of belief schedules, we have seen an increased fragmentation and more and more individualism uh, and the rise of, and we're gonna talk about those soon, of increasingly crazy uh, and competitive cultural packages from you know, new age, whatever, anti-vaxxing, wokeism, like you name it, people are increasingly just believing strange things. But we've also seen less entropy. So more and more, for example, everyone is, well, literally increasingly connected through the same platforms. Uh, we've also seen a few tech giants dominating the market. Uh, and let, let's pause for a second, those of us who are old enough to remember how the internet, like most things in the human timeline, has gone from the very many to the many fewer, has gone from, uh, a huge sort of visual ecological uh, diversity to increasingly looking like the same thing. So 
Those of us who were in North America in the late 90s might remember getting AOL, which was actually its own intranet of people who were only on AOL and there were these chat rooms that we could go into. Um, and then uh, dial-up internet arose and uh, there were uh, Lycos and Infoseek and Netscape navigators and there were like Yahoo groups. Uh, Google didn't really become a thing. Google was just one of many search engines and then it sort of gradually ate the market. Um, but the internet was a much, much more diverse place. Uh, there were, it was much more unpredictable. It was much more anthropic. It's become very, and I'm going to get to explaining that, very McDonaldized. Um, so now not only do we have a few tech giants like Google, Apple, uh, Netflix, uh, Amazon, and PornTube, or whatever it's called, dominating the market, but increasingly, and, and for better or for worse, we have a lot of data now. We know what the human, we know, we understand better uh, what the human brain and mind craves a few key themes that are dominating people's attention. Porn, shopping, flexing, so signaling, but also very, very much so fear, outrage, gossip, virtue signaling, so moral models that I'll return to, and then uh, a whole slew of, of, of really crazy neo-religious and also neo-primitive ontologies. So I'll, I'll get back to that in my, in my, very, la my very last slide. So McDonaldization, it's a thesis by the sociologist George Ritzer, uh, working in the Weberian tradition of understanding and, and critiquing processes of rationalization and standardization uh, that arise with modernity. What I don't like about a lot of mainstream contemporary Weberian indeed also Marxist sociology is that it's, it's often kind of a conspiracy theory. It's like there's these bad companies and these bad people who did these bad things and, and everybody else is sort of a passive victim. I'm much more interested in the naturalistic account of why all forms of lives and human forms of lives among, chiefly among which tend towards McDonaldization by virtue of the free energy principle, by, by virtue of a fundamental mechanism of the, of, the, of the universe whereby life forms, complex living systems, attempt to resist entropic disintegration, to minimize surprise, and to find the path of least energy expenditure to meet uh, its survival needs. So McDonaldization has been described in, in education, in film, you know, in, in healthcare, in like whatever domain or whatever institution of human life that you can think of. And it refers to, again, increased standardization, efficiency, predictability, transferability, and reach. So if you take, uh, let's talk a bit about the low entropy of Big Macs and the trade-offs, it's really interesting. So Big Macs are amazing. Uh, we all love them, we're gonna to need to explain why. Uh, it's always the same Big Mac. You can get it everywhere. You can get it all the time. You can get it really quickly. And um, you can't McDonaldize everything. Uh, as I'm always fond of saying, you can't McDonaldize the Talmud uh, because it's too complex. It's too boring for most people. So Big Macs work because they feed our need for predictability, uh, for the path of least resistance, and also our insatiable evolved cravings for fat, sugar, and salt. So you've all heard these stories, right? I mean, fat, sugar, and salt are nutritionally uh, important substances that were once really rare and hard to get uh, in the environment in which we evolved. So we evolved these cravings. Um, everybody likes French fries. Um, and then in an environment of hyperabundance, we have a lot of difficulty uh, satiating our needs. And then, and then, then of course comes the trade-off because once we're all eating Big Macs, there's a lot of things that we're not doing. Uh, so here, as a contrast, I'm, I apologize. I'm Orientalizing and I'm romanticizing, but this is a, a the Nowruz uh, Iranian Persian New Year, uh, which to me is the antithesis of a Big Mac. So. What have we lost now that we've all transitioned to fast food? Uh, fast food on Uber Eats, <laughs> delivered to your door. Uh, well, impulse control or health, you know, sustainable food production, sustainable consumption, sustainable, you know, cooperative business practices, but also the rich, uh, incredibly granular and, 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 and nuanced and deep, you know, narratives and rituals, uh, you know, and the affective quality of eating together, it's all gone because uh, 
and it's just too effortful. I think we, we, we'd rather have Big Mac. Um, yeah, so this, um, I'm sure many of you know of this, this is sometimes referred to as the, the great epidemiological transition. You must know uh, that many, many more people die of obesity related diseases than they die of famine, as indeed that's for a separate conversation, but it's part of the same problem. People die more by suicide than uh, homicides, um, war and terrorism included. So now let's talk about uh, cognitive, political and affective obesity. Let's talk about the fast information trade-off. So what have we gained and uh, what have we lost? So here we need to understand and elucidate, uh, you know, different aspects of the evolved human embodied affective minds. Uh, so what is the fat, sugar and salt that we are getting from the internet? What is the, and this is uh, Elon, Elon Musk, is, is fond of this metaphor, the limbic resonance of the internet. What is it that it does to, why does it so overly excite in bad ways our nervous system? So, well, let's talk about political obesity. I don't wanna belabor it too much because that, that's all we talk about now, the culture wars and, and us versus them. And, and we all know things are, things are absolutely insane, uh, but we need to explain rather than just pick a side and, and judge, we need to explicitate, we need to, we need to elucidate. Um, so the internet has taught us uh, that the psychologist Roy Baumeister, uh, who first started writing about the negativity bias in a famous paper called uh, Bad is Stronger Than Good, uh, Baumeister was right. Uh, we are, of course, by evolutionary design, it is advantageous. We are a deeply paranoid species. We're, of course, better off assuming that something, something that does not pose a threat actually poses a threat. We're better off having a faulty smoke alarm detector that has false positives all the time. So we're obsessed with threat detections. Uh, and we have, I don't have time to get into this, but all these culturally, symbolically, narratively enriched ways of, uh, of working our threat detection modalities in particular, our pollution avoidance modalities. So I'm very, very interested in that. I'm very interested in how xenophobia, uh, hatred of the other, uh, moral puritanism and so forth, always recruits virological metaphors. We talk about vermin, we talk about uh, our minds being infected, we talk about being sort of grossed out. So I think we have, we've evolved fairly early on uh, in, in probably in, in sort of like mammalian history, uh, an attentiveness to invisible threats, uh, parasites, uh, bacteria, later zoonotic viruses, but those came later with the Neolithic. Um, so we're obsessed with those. Uh, and we're always you know, trying to maintain some kind of a symbolic normative purity by avoiding pollution. And we've seen a lot of that online. Um, we've also seen that uh, epistemic vigilance as it is theorized by cognitive anthropologists, I think should be called, it ought to be called epistemic tribalism. So we've really seen that a lot. Uh, that we tend to judge uh, the quality of information, the trustworthiness of information, not at all whether or not it's empirically right or wrong. Typically the human mind is not good at assessing that based on its social source and not its content. So as you'll see, and, and you can try this now, you know, to, to, to see how it works, you know, perhaps, uh, perhaps you have, uh, uh, perhaps you have a, an extreme left-wing friend with like Trump derangement syndrome and uh, you want to you wanna send them something about how, you know, uh, I don't know, like particular kinds of like extreme left-wing ideology might go a little too far and send them something from Fox News or something that's not from like, a, you know, a tribally approved source, they'll dismiss it right away. And, and same uh, for the other way, like try to send one of your Trump loving friends a New York Times article, he won't even read it. Um, so we, we already knew this, but we know it more uh, now that we understand how people's clicking behavior. Um, and so we're seeing this mass hurting and we're seeing this allergy to nuance and this rise of conspiracy theories on all sides of the political spectrum. And we're seeing these increasingly martial narrative conflict. By martial, I mean warlike. I mean, people are at war over meaning, over how the world works and how it ought to work. So that was it for, for political obesity. We can talk about it again in, in the discussion section. Uh, 
part. Now, social obesity, what is the fat, salt, and sugar there? So there's, there's other uh, evolved attentional biases. I've, I've already made the claim, which is not my own uniquely, uh, that uh, social support um, is the most important resource uh, for humans. Um, and identifying our tribe, so building our coalition, who are the trustworthy people that I can learn from, uh, that I can look up to, that I can seek validation from, how can I signal to these people that I'm a good, uh, mo good morally standing human and that I'm a worthy recipient of love and care and so forth. And we're also obsessed with, uh, with prestige. Um, so prestige is just sort of an evolutionarily conferred strategy to identify, uh, it's a proxy for status, so not, not so much physical dominant status, but sort of social prestige and high cultural capital. So what is the most up-to-date, the most relevant, the most in vogue, the most socially useful uh, model? Uh, so people are have always been obsessed with that, but we have again with the internet make that explicit and make that literal. So I think it's fascinating that we, we have more or less organically invented literal indicators of social prestige and popularity. So numbers of likes, um, numbers of share. So of course humans already had in their head something of a social credit monitoring system and a social prestige tracking system, but now we've, we've made it literal. It's really anxiogenic, especially for young people, especially for those young people who even pre-COVID were already mostly socializing and negotiating um, the difficulties and nuance of trying to be a good social person online. Um, so popularity and lack thereof and, and mocking and shaming and outrage and gossip and all these fundamentally normal necessary human institutions, now that they've become really hysterical online, are uniquely addictive. Um, so they make people feel like crap most of the time, yet, yet we return. We do it because this feeds our most fundamental need. Uh, for being connected with others, for being seen, for, for seeing others. And it's interesting how from a niche construction perspective, this works for all kinds of personality types, right? So the more extroverted people or cultures, they can be compulsive, compulsive posters. Uh, the more uh, introverted can be sort of, you know, passive, anxious lurkers. Uh, there's something, there's a trap for everyone. There's a trap for every type in this kind of world. Um, yeah, so we do this. Uh, and then, Affective obesity. So this one, this one is interesting and is going to require a couple more detours. Uh, before concluding, I think I'm going to, for once, manage to begin uh, to, to end uh, before the allocated time and hopefully have a provocative discussion. Um, so let's go back to the fundamental human drives and needs, the need for care, the need to give care, of course, the need for love, the need for sex. Uh, the need for pair bonding, uh, and the need for finding some kind of an arrangement in which we can, uh, uh, well, most of us, you know, reproduce. And let's talk about this through the lens of McDonaldization and entropy and that double bind that I'm again going to conclude with. So let's go farther back in time or in space in a sort of a toy model of uh, a low entropy cultural package solution that most human cultures, most human societies had reverted to, because again, it's fine, it's good, it's normal, right? Like the, the, the human mind does not like uncertainty, ambiguity, it likes to find sort of efficient solution to fitness problems. So made choice, um, courtship and so forth, in a lot of human societies uh, was outsourced to tradition, to elders, to expert matchmakers, but as in you know, a lot of pre-modern societies, the life choices were, were sort of already there. You know, they're not relegated to the burden of individual choice. So people know what classes of people they can or should marry, when to have kids, how to raise them, with whom. Uh, the, some of these societies have, have uh, almost no courtship rit rituals. Some do, uh, but again, within a sort of a prescriptive pool of the kinds of cross cousins that you're allowed to marry uh, or not. But there's, there's again, the expectations are, are quite clear and then people have these sort of like, yeah, you know, very minimally entropic performative possibilities. They play the game, uh, boom, it's done. Of course, uh, you know, the, the, the trade-off is that for, for a lot of people, this, this was probably already true before these 
uh, really infectious ideas of individualism started spreading, there are always people for whom this feels a little too constraining. Uh, novelty seeking is, is, has always existed and indeed it, it, it needed to from a niche construction perspective, we need to both conserve uh, and innovate and, and adapt. So anyway, that's, that's a sort of a low entropy made choice. One that many of us uh, millennials, Gen X and, and, and boomers uh, are familiar with is the modern uh, high entropy make choice scenario. One in which uh, the choice is mostly outsourced to chance. So chance is very entropic, again, anxiogenic, uh, to personal preference. And then, uh, so once, once there's, a lot of, there's a lot of that kind of entropy, the, the, the anti-entropic buffer is that people tend to recreate uh, different kinds of cosmologies and narratives to reduce entropy. So for example, fate, finding your soulmate, finding your twin flame, or people resort to astrology. They still try to ex externalize the choice to some kind of a fixed system because it's less anxiogenic. But in any case, these are, these are the kinds of societies that, that most of us grew up in. You know, It works for some people, doesn't work for a lot of people. Uh, I think as a species, we've yet to find the ideal recipe to make people affectively and, and sexually happy. We're, we're just trying our best, I guess. Now, the courtship rituals are very interesting in these kinds, uh, these kinds of societies um, because they're, if not maximally entropic, they're really in that sort of like critical range of like a, a lot of really interesting possible states. So what's interesting in, uh, in individualistic mate choice societies is that the courtship rituals are usually very counterfactuals. So you flirt with someone, but you're pretending that you're not flirting. Uh, both parties know, know that flirting is going on, but you could still save face, which is interesting by pretending. It's only when the erotic tensions become untenable that one person makes a move and so forth. But in doing so, in engaging in these kinds of really effortful, really empathic, kinds of rituals, you really learn to exercise all kinds of social, affective, cognitive muscles. Uh, you really learn to navigate a lot of nuance, a lot of ambiguity and so forth. So, so that's, that's, I claim at least like a, a really interesting part of this package. Still because of in individualism, because of the sort of the bottomless needs, of course, fear of missing out, FOMO and FOBO, which means fear of a better option, uh, are on the rise. So fear of a better option is, um, is buyer's regret, right? So you, you, you get a partner or, or whatever, a job, uh, a burger, and then you realize that the menu is so big, like you could have had another burger or like a hotter partner or something like this. And so, so you get buyer's regret. So, so of course, this is, this is for sure a sign of these, these kind of high entropy uh, mating possibilities. Now I claim, uh, we, we have more of a double bind. Uh, so as compared to uh, courtship life from say the 1950s to the early 2000s, uh, entropy has increased and decreased again in different domains. Uh, so entropy has increased in people's expectations now are absolutely through the roofs. This is not a moral judgment. When I talk about personal entitlement, it's just an empirical observation that people increasingly have an enormous amount of boxes that they feel they need to tick uh, in, in order to feel like they've attained a good enough life. Um, it's usually mathematically impossible to be to tick all these boxes, and then and then the, the, the temporality of anxiety has also been extended. We we worry about the past, we get buyer's regret, we worry about what the future might happen. It's really a mess. Um, the ritual prescriptions are almost entirely gone, especially for younger generations, there's really no, um, the, the, let's just say that the expectations, you know, how do you meet someone? How do you seduce someone? How, how can you be a, a good man, woman, or other gendered person and so forth? There's been such a, an explosion of new identities, sexualities, ways of being that people don't really know how to behave, um, what to feel. Uh, the array of choice is, is enormous. So yeah, there's been a, a big increase in entropy. At the same time, and, and this, is a, this was already true uh, pre-COVID, but now this is uh, especially in high-income countries, literally true. Uh, 
if you want to meet new people, you, you got to go online. It's like basically dating apps only. So, so in terms of, of actual uh, collective schedules and uh, possibilities of interaction, there's been an enormous decrease uh, in entropy, ch chance happenings, uh, and, 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 and really pause, especially now in the COVID moment, like think about it, um, think of how immeasurably reduced your possibilities of chance encounters and social interactions are. Think of all the social ties, the weak ties as sociologists call them, all the people that you used to see every day, even if you didn't know their name, the, the, the barista who gives you the, la the latte, the person you sit next to on the bus and so forth. This is, it's all gone. Um, and, and things had already been moving to dating apps only. Of course, the, uh, the presentation of self in everyday life, as Goffman used to put it, you know, the sort of the, the face, the avatar that, that, that we present is literally an avatar now, hugely reductive, uh, extremely minimalistic. So, so there's uh, Tinder used to dominate the market now that there's a few more, but, but they're all tending towards this kind of McDonaldized minimalism. Uh, so you, you, you just swipe, uh, it's sort of like an infinite menu of, of burgers. Uh, and very interestingly, we're back to pre-modern times where the ambiguity and the performative complexity of courtship has been eliminated. So very much as in a traditional society where the matchmaker sets you up on a date with an eligible mate, you know, when you meet someone from a dating app, it's a job interview. It's explicitly a job interviews. The counterfactuals have been removed. Um, both partners are rationally uh, evaluating themselves, one another as potential mates. Uh, of course, they're still trying to maintain a degree of performative counterfactual, but it, it, it doesn't work. Uh, and, and, and in doing so, and this is, this is just one picture, one micro sociological picture in, uh, this huge reduction in the complexity, nuance, improvisational possibilities of social interactions of all kinds. So here I'm just giving this, this toy image of, of dating and courtship. And as such, you see what may be a, a sort of erosion of cognitive, affective, and, and sexual empathy, right? Like our, our, our models of other people's minds and feelings and needs is, is uh, increasingly poor and sparse. Probably our own self-model as a result is increasingly poor um, and, and, and sparse. So there you have it. Uh, my thesis, you know, the, the, the double bind of uh, increases in entropy in, in the sociocultural domain, but in, 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 in some aspects of the, the bureaucratic domain of, of sociality, uh, a, a huge reduction of entropy. Um, so again, in, in general, you have uh, uh, an unprecedented decrease in collective trust, uh, trust in collective narratives, collective cultural bearings, collective uh, kinds of cultural models. Um, again, before we didn't all have to cooperate and compete in the same digital agora. So it didn't really matter if people four mountains away had a really kind of different cultural model, but now, now we're all busy. Now I, um, I sometimes think that inter-group competition is over. All there is is intra-group competition. We're all, which is great. We've expanded the circle of empathy, at least the possibility of it. Uh, we've, we've expanded possibilities of cooperation and we're all stuck together now in some kind of a primitive village trying to negotiate the rules and trying to negotiate the norms. Um, and of course we can't agree. And because we've mostly in the high income West spreading, we've mostly just eliminated the old, uh, in many ways, rich kinds of cultural packages. Then we're reinventing everything from scratch. So we're going back to very primitive forms of social interaction. Uh, we're going back to shame based forms of gossip, as opposed to the more subtle, the more civilized, you know, guilt, uh, you know, there, there, there's some virtues to guilt and passive aggressiveness. It's, it's, it's actually sort of maximally complex empathically uh, in terms of navigating subtle counterfactuals and allowing other people to, to save face. Now we're not, we're just like, we're, um, we're about to behead each other in, in some kind of a primitive village. Uh, we also have, and this is super interesting, uh, you know, up until let's say the mid 1800s, in a lot of places up until the mid 20th century, um, 
you could talk to say your great grandmother, she would have the same accent as you, the same cultural uh, bearings, the, the same kinds of models. Um, now that's not the case at all. Now we have intergenerational acculturation, uh, not just between uh, millennials and boomers, but even between different subspecies of millennials and generation Z that don't even have names for one another. Uh, generations that were primarily socialized into very different internet ecologies, very different meme ecologies. There's a sort of intergenerational radical alterity. Uh, so radical alterity in the sense of people whose cultural models are so different, they lack a common script to understand each other. Um, so again, the, the internet precipitated that. Uh, and, and, and if you plot the exponentiality of the curve, you, you might wonder, you might ask, of course, well, where is this going? How, how is this going to end? Do people just at some point become all reasonable and, and organize into a lovey-dovey global village of uh, niceness? I don't think so. Um, so that's, that's actually it uh, in terms of the very broad outline of what I wanted to share. So first of all, thank you, Samuel, for an incredibly rich and stimulating uh, uh, what, uh, exploration of our moment and perhaps of the future, both immediate and maybe even far distant. You've laid it out so elegantly and so provocatively that it just is really good to think with. So I really want to thank you. Please write a book. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> <laughs>